I became what's called orthodox. I don't like particularly like labels, but I'll just say that relatively late in my life, I began to worry about saying uh, my prayers on a regular basis. In traditional Jewish practice, that's three times a day. That's morning, afternoon, and night. So since uh, I was in my early 30s, I've been doing that. And there's at some point where you realize I'm saying the words, but not much is happening. And as a result, I started looking into what prayer means, what people have had to say about it. I was looking for inspiration. And I started teaching a class on Jewish prayer in my synagogue in suburban Maryland. And I'll never forget, I made the observation in that class that a lot of times I don't know if anyone's listening to my prayers. I don't know if God exists. I like the idea that God exists, but I'm not 100% sure. And I look around the room, and, and depending what kind of synagogue you're in, there's a large number of people who appear to believe that God exists and are acting accordingly. They're doing what is called shuckling in Yiddish or some language. I don't know what language that is. Rocking back and forth. Sometimes they're gesturing with their hands. Sometimes they're saying things out loud. Of course, in suburban synagogues, there's a lot less of that. That's considered bad form. I've been in synagogues where I was reproached for being too enthusiastic about the job at hand. But in general, it's more subdued, say, than in a Hasidic shtibel, to take an example. But you look around the room and you think, boy, everyone else seems to be um, talking to God. But I'm not sure I am. So I was teaching this class and I was talking like that. And I was saying that, you know, for a modern person, it's often helpful to give that some thought and to not just go through the motions, not just so-called check the box. So after class, a woman came up to me in tears and she thanked me and I said, why are you crying? And she said, I thought I was the only one. So she's not the only one. There's at least two of us. And I think there's probably a few more who find the act of prayer troubling or unsatisfying in many ways. You know, one of the ways it's troubling is that in normative traditional Judaism, God knows all our thoughts. God knows the future. God is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. Why am I asking for stuff? So at one level, the prayers that are petitionary, not all prayers petitionary, but at some level, petitionary prayer is troubling, I think, to a person of faith. But more generally, I think faith is challenging for many modern people. Again, I don't know about you, but I read them in translation. I don't get much out of it. You know, it starts off, blessed art thou, O Lord our God. Blessed art thou, our God, and the God of our fathers. That's the opening of the Amidah. I don't know what that means. I have no idea what that means. I'm blessing God. That that seems really strange. Why am I invoking our fathers? And then in case you didn't know, I say it again. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I don't invoke the mothers. But if I did, it wouldn't help much. It's mysterious. I say the same thing every time, whether it's weekday, Shabbat, Shavuot, Rosh Hashanah. Every Amidah starts with the same 42 words. You can read them in English. As I I think I say in the essay, they don't make my heart sing. I find it, if anything, a barrier. I mean, wouldn't it be better to spontaneously burst into jubilant praise? Wouldn't it be better to speak from the heart about what's on your mind, your troubles? And yet Jewish law mandates the same words over and over and over again. You know, I used to read Stopping by Woods on a Snow Evening by Robert Frost to my daughter every night for a long time. And certainly many, many dozens of times. We both knew it by heart. It wasn't boring. And there's a challenge. I love reading that poem to my daughter. I think it would be nice to love reciting the words of the Amidah to uh, the divine with that same level of love and affection. And I know that my daughter, who learned it by heart, was happy to hear it over and over again. And I like to think that if there is a God who is listening, that God is happy to hear it for the nth time. But that's the challenge. But certainly, the repetition that we're talking about here with these two sides, I think it's hugely important. It seems like a bug, but I think it's a feature. It's probably not what you would pick. It's a little bit like, oh, let's write our own vows for our wedding. A very reasonable thought and a beautiful thought. Or let's write our own poem to go with our vows. Or let's pick different poems or different melodies or different songs to run through our wedding. And people do that all the time. It's a beautiful thing. But there's something about putting those alongside rather than replacing the vows that have been said over over and over and over again. You know, sometimes those vows are challenging, just like there are things in prayer that we find intellectually challenging, hard to believe, sometimes even troubling. And again, part of this project is to find ways 
to face those honestly and belief in general would fall into that for me. I don't think most people find belief easy, find right, faith right. easy. And I think there's a lot you can get out of prayer without any faith, even if you say the same words that the people with faith have been saying. But I think there's another aspect to it that I think transcends you know, any kind of particular level of belief, which is you don't have to be religious to appreciate the transcendent, things that seem larger than ourselves. If you look up at the sky on a cold winter night when the clouds are gone and the stars are bright, you have a certain feeling that is hard to describe. Again, it's a feeling of transcendence, a feeling of the ineffable, something that is larger than you that you have trouble putting into words. For me, the act of prayer is a way to connect to that. And I would also add that the word for prayer in Hebrew, tefillah, does not mean request. It does not mean to beseech. It does not mean to ask. There's a different ways of interpreting what the word means, but one of them is to cleave, to attach oneself. Another meaning is to examine yourself. Uh, the hit palel, to, to pray, is to examine oneself. That's a good exercise, whether you think someone else cares about that or not, that's... Um, infinite. And so the act of prayer, not always the words, which is why I think there's a, there's a challenge, but the act of prayer as an act of self-transcendence is extremely valuable. I don't want to suggest that belief is unimportant or that these kind of thought exercises that, that we're hinting at are a replacement for a serious connection to the God of the patriarchs and the matriarchs, because uh, I think it's it's more than just a nice feeling that, that you're small and that they're important things. But I do think it's hard in the modern world to come in contact with those things that are transcendent. We don't see much of them in the modern world. Um, certainly urban living doesn't have so much of it that's obvious. There's some that's there under the surface. So prayer three times a day is a chance to connect to something quite magnificent. How much of that is literally divine and godlike is to be discovered. It's to be explored to me. I'm in certain sense on paper a believer, but somewhere else in my heart I'm an agnostic. And so I think that's okay. I think the key is to search, to examine, to explore, to wonder, to have awe. Those are the parts of a, a life that I think uh, Judaism should encourage and, and does if, if we think about it the right way.